As much as we all wait for the summer, this season is going crazy. I mean, a typical summer in Death Valley can be as hot as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. But you know what? The year 1816 was a total bummer. Guess why? Because that year, there was literally no summer at all. Seriously, where was all the warmth and sunshine in Europe and North America? Well, turns out the answer lies on the other side of the world, at Mount Tambora in Indonesia. Now picture this. On April 5, 1815, Mount Tambora, a mighty volcano far away in Bali, started making some serious noise. And boy, did it explode. It was the biggest volcanic eruption ever recorded in history. The eruption was so intense that it spewed tons of ash and aerosols into the atmosphere, blocking out the sun and turning the sky into a gloomy mess. The ash even fell on nearby towns, burying them under layers of ash. There were reports of several feet of ash floating on the ocean surface. Imagine sailing through that mess. But here's where it gets really crazy. Those tiny particles of ash and aerosols were light enough to travel through the atmosphere for months. They made their way into the stratosphere, spreading all over the world. Do you see what I'm driving at? They caused the Earth's average temperature to drop nearly 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Thankfully, it was only temporary, and eventually, even the smallest particles fell out of the atmosphere, allowing the sunshine to return. If you imagine the year without a summer as a year when you have to wear a down jacket even in July, you're right. If you could only pick three words to describe that summer, these would be cold, gloomy, and dark. That summer of 1816, it was snowing in New England. Western Europe had cold rain nonstop. It was a total climate roller coaster with temperatures. Europe was hit the hardest, with summer temperatures reaching record breaking lows. We're talking about the coldest summer in over 200 years. Now, let's take a look at the year without summer's impact on Europe and North America. It was a disaster. A ton of serious problems happened all across the Northern Hemisphere. Crops were wiped out by frost or lack of sunlight, leaving people hungry and desperate. Farmers who managed to grow crops were terrified of being robbed because food became so valuable. And get this. With the scarcity of oats, which became super expensive, it cost a fortune to feed horses. Guess what that means? Travel became ridiculously expensive since horses were the main mode of transportation back then. But hey, maybe this crazy situation inspired a dude named Carl Dre to invent the bicycle. Who needs a horse when you can pedal your way around, right? This is how it happened. Carl was like, hmm, maybe there's a better way to get around without relying on animals. Let's use some good old human power. And that's how the Laufmaschine, uh, pardon my German, the bicycle was born. Fast forward a year, Carl decided to take his Laufmaschine for its first ride in Mannheim. This thing was known as the Dreising, Velocipede, or Dandy Horse in England. It was basically the OG version of bicycles and motorbikes, using the two-wheel principle. This machine weighed about 48 pounds, had wheels with brass ball bearings covered in iron, and was mostly made out of wood. No pedals, but it was still steerable and had a rear wheel brake. It even had a short tail in front to keep it balanced. On June 12, 1817, Carl hopped in his Lausch machine and rode from Mannheim to a coaching inn, which was about 8 miles away. He did it in under an hour. Not bad for a wooden bike without pedals, huh? The year without a summer also had a big impact on the settling of the American heartland. A ton of people, especially those poor farm families who got wiped out by the disaster, said peace out to New England and headed to western New York and the Northwest Territory. They were on the hunt for a better climate, richer soil, and just overall better conditions for growing stuff. Indiana became a state in 1816, followed by Illinois two years later. Plus, Vermont took a major hit in population during this time. Like we're talking about a decrease of 10,000 to 15,000 people. It's like erasing seven whole years of population growth. Now, to borrow a bicycle analogy, let's switch gears for a sec. In June 1816, it rained like crazy during the summer. So these famous peeps, like Mary Shelley, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Lord Byron, and John William Polidori were stuck inside the Villa Diodati in Switzerland. 
They were on vacation, but Mother Nature was not cooperating. So they decided to have a little contest to see who could write the scariest story. Mary Shelley ended up writing Frankenstein, which we all know is a classic. And Lord Byron wrote this thing called a fragment, which Polidori later used as the inspiration for the vampire, which was like a prequel to Dracula. Can you imagine being stuck inside with these literary geniuses? Anyway, those days at Villa Diodati were pretty intense. They were filled with tension and deep conversations about life and stuff. Mary Shelley even had a dream about Frankenstein while she was there, and that's how her famous story began. Oh, and Lord Byron got inspired to write a poem called Darkness, because one day it got so dark that the birds went to bed early and they had to light candles like it was midnight. The poem is all about the year without a summer, so it's like he turned the crazy weather into art. So, after Mount Tambora blew its top, the atmosphere was all filled up with tephra, creating this hazy sky that stuck around for a few years. And you know what? Those sunsets were absolutely stunning, with rich red hues that you would only see after a volcanic eruption. Paintings from that time totally back it up, too. They show that these vibrant reds weren't around before the eruption. But that's not all. The paintings also got all moody and dark, even when the sun and moon were shining. It's like everyone's mood took a turn for the worse. Instead of happy and carefree afternoons, the themes shifted to religion, industry, and just a hint of despair. The artists were all about capturing reality. So these paintings were like snapshots of life before and after the eruption. Take Caspar David Friedrich's works, for example. His pieces like The Monk by the Sea and Two Men by the Sea really show this change in mood. Right, if there was a year without summer, there must have been at least one year without winter. Yep, the winter of 1877-78 in the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota was like no other. They even called it the year without a winter. It was the warmest winter on record, with an average temperature of 29 degrees Fahrenheit from December to February. Now, you might think that the people living there back then were loving this warm weather, right? Well, not exactly. See, back in those days, they relied heavily on horses and sleigh for travel. But with the lack of snow and dirt roads, it made getting around a real pain in the you-know-what. Businesses were also affected because they couldn't move their goods easily. Despite the overall warmth, there were a few freezing days in early January 1878 that froze the mighty Mississippi River in St. Paul. It was closed for navigation until the end of February. Only three days for the rest of the cool season had single-digit temperatures or lower. The warmth didn't stop there. Even March 1878 was unusually warm. The first boat arrived in Duluth, Minnesota on March 17th, which was way earlier than usual. And lakes like Minnetonka and Osakis lost their ice way ahead of schedule, too. It was like spring came knocking on their doors super early. It may seem that all this warmth meant it was a dry winter, but nope. From December 1877 to February 1878, they actually had over 3 inches of precipitation. That's more than the average for that time. Mother Nature sure knows how to keep us on our toes.